alphabetical order, we're going to ask our candidates to introduce themselves and to say why it is that they are standing uh, for Parliament to represent this constituency. Uh, and just so that we're all aware, uh, for both the statements and the questions, to try and make it fair, we're timing our responses. We have uh, up to two minutes. You don't have to take as long as two minutes. We'll get through more questions, uh, the shorter the answers are. Um, but Emma has got a little clock there, and don't argue with Emma if we go over, <laughs> over her time. All right, so she'll indicate, whoops, you can't see it because, you know, we're all older than you, Emma. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll give you some signals when you're running out of time. Okay, so that's today. I'm asking people to re-elect me as their Member of Parliament based on my constituency record. That is one of public service, trying to help people with their various problems but not always solving them. Uh, I've never been uh, a Member of Parliament who has been ambitious in terms of a career. I've always put the constituency first. Now, in the 2010 church hustings, I asked people to change the government. I said that for a number of reasons. Little did I know that uh, the election would result in a stalemate. So instead of having a conservative majority, we went into coalition. I also, ladies and gentlemen, didn't realize the state of the public finances. And much as I very much uh, like the former Chief Secretary of the Treasury, when he left that note saying there was no, no money left, I'm afraid that is when we realised the nightmares that we faced. The economy was in a terrible state, and unless you can manage the economy, then you can't provide any public services. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you to re-elect me as your Member of Parliament, based on my constituency record, also asking you to keep the recovery going, and to make sure that our kingdom is united. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, Paul Collins, please. Thank you. Uh, you don't have to touch it. It's all. Oh, I see. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for coming along this evening to listen to us and to put us through the mill and find out what we think. I appreciate that, and I will thank you for the church for arranging this. Um, I'm your Liberal Democrat candidate. My name is Paul Collins. Uh, you'll hear my policies as the questions unfold this evening. So a little bit about myself first. Uh, South End, I was, I was born in Bedford, but I moved here in 1982, and raised my family here. Um, some of the members are here today. And it's a very important part of my life at South End. Um, I'm a Liberal person. I was joined the party in 1974, and that's what makes me. My liberal ethos, defending our human rights and our civil liberties, is one reason why I'm standing in front of you tonight. It's very important that the liberal voice is heard this general election, because there's a lot of brush and noise from all sorts of people in this election, and I want to make sure that our voice is heard. I care about South End. I was a councillor for four years in Westbrook Ward. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Had some success with the people there, and it's something that I want to bring forward into the national arena. I do listen to people, I do work with people. I'm an Italian from the South and West, a town that I love. Thank you. Hi, yes, uh, I'm John Fuller, standing for the Green Party. I've uh, lived in the constituency for 40 years, uh, and I have a lot of people here tonight. Um, I'm going to kick off with something that's very difficult sometimes to listen to, but it's fundamental to what the Green Party is all about, and it's incredibly important, I think, for everybody in this room. Sometimes tackling the issue of climate change can be very uncomfortable to listen to, but I'm quickly going to touch on that because it's so crucial to everything. Um, our moral leaders, our church leaders, uh, are speaking in ever stronger terms in connection with climate change. The Vatican the Catholic Church has spoken out very powerfully powerfully on the issue of climate change, saying that we as individuals are responsible and we must act. Um, the Church of England is being very powerful. There's some, again, very challenging remarks, like the uh, Bishop of London saying that um, flying is a symptom of sin. Well, that's a very difficult message sometimes to uh, take on board. Um, the Baptist uh, Times, um, I've, I've read an article uh, just today um, from the Reverend Dr. John Weaver. 
Um, and I commend that to you. I think if you haven't seen it, please make time to read that. Um, so our, our religious leaders are making some very powerful comments on climate change. It must be addressed, and we all have a responsibility. Uh, the Green Party, we listen to groups like um, the Bodies Like the, uh, the um, uh, Pentagon. The Pentagon has done analysis on the risks to national security. It's a risk multiplier, they say, for the United States right now. It's a clear and present danger to um, all nations on that earth, and it will be, and it will cause conflict between nations, and that conflict will grow. We listen to the OECD, and the IMF, bodies such as the World Bank and our own Bank of England tell us that climate change must be addressed. There are huge economic issues associated with climate change. The government of Bank of England has spoken out about this. He tells us that we must be ready to divest from fossil fuels. We have to tackle climate change, and our party has got the solutions to do so. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all. I'm Brian Oatridge, the UK Independence Party candidate, and I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Southend, in Windsor Road, Westcliff. However, I didn't last very long here. My father was a mobile civil servant. He led a nomadic life, so I followed on, but I had a fortnight's summer holiday in Southend every summer with, uh, with my grandmother, who did continue to live here. So I've got very happy childhood memories of, of Southend. Um, I became a nomad myself. I joined the Air Force and I have my RAF tie on today because I, I went for the uh, Royal St. George service this morning in St. John's in the centre of South End. Um, cut a long story short, why am I back here? Well, I've only been in politics two years. I reached the point two years ago where I was becoming a very grumpy old man shouting at the television a lot every time I saw any one of the other political leaders on and decided to do something about it to stop being grumpy. So I joined the party that seemed to have the best alignment with my view of life, which was UKIP. And since then, I've developed my political career within the party through being an activist. And when the time came, when I was uh, assessed as being fit to stand as an MP, where should I stand? I've been a nomad. I've lived all over the place. I thought, the town of my birth, I should go back there, and that's where I am now, having a fresh insight in, into the town that I already knew. Anyway, what is my party offering you? I think, I believe, it's the headline of it is well known. We've been accused of being a single-issue party, but it is still at the centre of our policy, believing that Britain should come out of the EU to govern itself, because the impact of all the various things that the EU force on us, the, the um, Okay, well, thanks, Brian. That's a very helpful introduction, but it's more than two minutes. Um, so let's set the ground rules and keep to it. To the word up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, I echo the sentiment that inviting us here. Uh, my name is Julian Merlane. I am the Labour Party candidate. Uh, I was born in 1959 in Fairfax Drive in Westerville Sea and lived less than a mile from where I was born. Uh, so this is for who's living here the longest and I get a big one there. Um, my ethos, my political backbone, my DNA in terms of politics is wrapped up in one word, that's equality. But it's more than that, it's about treating everyone with respect, about respecting all views, about inclusiveness, about believing in such thing as society, and that society includes all of us about combating prejudice and intolerance wherever it is found. I am a community activist, uh, the way you, do it, you do read the local newspaper, may have seen the occasional appearance by myself. Um, I fought uh, a number of issues, most recently uh, the principle on, on, on this sex establishment that's been uh, allowed to go ahead in uh, South Church Road. Um, I'm a member of Amnesty International, in, outside of politics, in a national trust, so I have a wide range of interests. And I'm a long standing local football referee, and local sport is something that's very dear to my heart. Um, the other candidates have touched on one or two things that are very important in this election, and I will echo the sentiments about having an economy that is working, that works for all of us and not just the minority. And one of the things that has desperately gone wrong in recent years is the huge gap between the wealthiest and those who are not wealthy. It's also about climate change, and I do echo some of what 
Al Green Camp that has said, uh, I am too an environmentalist and also have a right campaigner. Um, but it is ultimately a, a choice of government. Um, it may not be fair, but our electoral system means that it will be Labour or Tories. I'm getting the countdown, so I'll say thank you very much and I'm sure you'll interrogate me in the course of the evening. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So let's, let's go on with our first question, which is on the issue of homelessness. Over the winter months, several churches worked together to provide meals and shelter for South End's homeless community. 350 volunteers gave over 10,000 hours of their time, 125 people used the service for overnight shelter, and over 4,000 meals were served. To what extent do you agree that South End has a housing issue that causes a homelessness problem and what would you and your party do to tackle affordable housing and homelessness, both locally and nationally? If we could start with Brian Oakridge, please. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, off, oh, sorry, um, I'm painfully aware of the pressure on housing when I moved here looking for rental property myself. The properties were going, rental properties, off the market in, in less than a day. So there is considerable pressure on the housing stock in South End, and we don't have much space to build here. So it's inevitable that these problems will occur. And I applaud the churches for the work they do. Indeed, our party, we feel it's very important to integrate the work of the NHS and social services with the third sector. And we have policies that would introduce a coordinating mechanism there. But coming back to the root problem, the pressure on housing. Why is it there? It is because the population is increasing and the housing stock isn't going up. Now, yes, the, the South End population is going up and clearly one of our key policies is by leaving the EU, we will be able to control our own borders to prevent this unknown rise. And we have, I must stress, nothing against the individuals who come here. They are taking advantage of what our government offers them and that is the beef we have with the system. And so that is one level of it. The other level is we would introduce what we're calling a brownfield uh, housing revolution of, of uh, easing the planning restrictions and providing uh, <coughs> some money to actually encourage the, the redevelopment of brownfield sites, which really in South End is just about the only option for any additional house building. And of course, easing the pressure on numbers will assist with um, bringing the prices down as well to make it more affordable. Thank, Thank you very much. John Fuller of the Green Party. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, sometimes um, through my environmental campaigning over the many years, I've had to give uh, people unwelcome messages and I won't make any change to that habit now. Uh, the UK population is growing at an unprecedented rate. Um, we approach this issue very different to the way that the UK approach this issue, but there is simply no avoiding that fact that we will see very great changes in the nature of our uh, society over the coming 25 years. The population will probably go around about by 10 million over the next 25 years. So um, uh, we have a huge challenge. At the same time, how home building in the UK has plummeted much lower than it was immediately after the Second World War. We have really failed in the UK when it comes to home building. So the Green Party, what we're proposing to do is to address this in two ways. One is to build 500,000 social homes to rent, um, uh, that will be council houses and uh, housing associations, for people to rent. And that will assist us in taking the pressure out of the private uh, uh, housing market, reduce prices by increasing supply. We, uh, we can help to take the pressure off those prices and uh, ensure that people, those people who do want to buy will have a better chance of being able to do so. Um, I hope this evening that we get a chance to talk about grinding inequality in this country because there is an important factor there in this, which is that we are seeing a huge transfer of wealth from the poorest in society to the richest, and also from the young to the old. And this must also be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Collins. Thank you. Um, the question is actually quite in detail, actually, I would actually go into detail. Um, as a councillor, I had the opportunity 
to witness the volunteers and the uh, 350 volunteers I salute. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet a number of them at St. Andrew's Church last winter and the winter before, um, and to actually just sit with them making the tea, that's always what I like to do, or when I do more like cooking food, that would be too dangerous for everyone, but I had an opportunity to talk to people, talk to the people there, and to say that home is, is just an overarching statement, it really needs a much more closer look. Mental health issues there that we need to address, and, and I'm glad my party has put that forward as one of its manifesto issues. We talked about investing into the NHS, not just for the ordinary things that we need to make ourselves better, but also for mental health. It needs to come up, because people are homeless for all sorts of reasons. It is not easy just to say, you've built the houses, they are, go and live in them. It's much, much deeper than that. The party also has ambitious plans in its manifesto. 300,000 a year during this parliament in 10 garden cities in this country. We need to be much more ambitious. John is right, we need to work on this and provide the homes. We also need to make able for people to have the ability to invest as a stakeholder in their property through their rental. It's very important. But going back to the initial question, South End Council does a very good job actually to enable these churches to operate the way it does. And I applaud that and I was glad to be part of that. We need, South End has an issue with housing and we we'll always will have that. We need to, outside our borders, to make it possible for people to have homes in the South East. We welcome people, I mean we'll come to other issues I'm sure like two years later, so I won't detain you with that now. But homelessness is an issue that needs to be dealt with and it's not just building homes, we need to look at the people in the situation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think we as politicians know what the problems are, it's the solutions which are increasingly difficult to uh, deliver. And I think it's not just a question of the increase in population of the United Kingdom, but it's also the uh, tremendous changes in family arrangements. Where I grew up in the East End of London, uh, everyone stayed in their homes, families were together. Now I know for my own children, they quickly want a place of their own. And it's very, very difficult to keep up with the demand. I think, ladies and gentlemen, the housing situation will improve as the economy recovers. There's no doubt at all about that. And as already been said, there has been a lack of new houses built in the country and the constituency. But in 2007, it was at a crisis level. And I'm very pleased to say since then, we do have more houses being built. Now in South End, there are plans for a new housing development, Bellway Homes in Prittlewell. Uh, I can see it firsthand there, having dealt with local residents. Uh, not everyone welcomes the development of new homes being built. They were delighted to have the new hospice there, but there are all sorts of problems regarding access and transport. So this is not really an easy issue. But the government intends a billion pound extension of the local infrastructure fund for large scale housing sites to unlock around a quarter of a million homes over the next six years. The government is helping community groups build new homes through the community right to build. And in essence, I think that the local authority is making a good start in building more homes again. Thank you. And Julian Wade. House building currently stands at the lowest it's been since the 1920s and uh, the failure of the current Conservative and Liberal Democrat government is laid bare in that statistic. Uh, homelessness is an issue in the South End. Uh, it's something that I see firsthand. I am the council's representative on the homeless actual resource projects and I see firsthand some of the issues they're doing, also seeing the excellent work they do as well. The answer is pretty straightforward in, in terms of articulating that means we need to build more homes, uh, we need to build more social housing as well, uh, quite clearly uh, not everyone can afford to buy, uh, although the prohibitive cost of housing in part is down to the simple uh, economics of supply and demand. I and my Labour Party, if we were so fortunate as to be elected on May the 7th, are committed to a house building programme. 
Um, it's, I mean, I am grateful for the work of churches, some of which I have witnessed firsthand. There are seven local churches who do tremendous work during the very coldest months. Um, but actually, they only scratch the surface of the problem. It's not just the rough sleepers who quite often are found in the ward that I represent on the council, as I have the town centre. Uh, I'm lucky enough to represent the town centre, but there's an awful lot of sofa surfing uh, going on as well. The, so, to paraphrase what I've said, there is a housing problem, but most definitely homelessness is an issue, and the solution is to build more housing. Thank you very much. So, let's move to our second question this evening, which concerns food banks. South End currently has six food bank distribution centres, two of which are in this constituency. The Trussell Trust have recently said that over the last 12 months, three days food was given out well over a million times, and over a third of this food was given for children. These statistics that do not include the figure of numerous, uh, numerous other charities engaging in similar initiatives shows an increase of food bank use of 19% compared to the previous 12 months. Why do you think there has been such a dramatic increase in the need of food banks and what would you do to reverse this trend? Paul Cox, please. Thank you. Undeniably, there's an issue. Um, we certainly need to look at the way that the benefit system is being changed by the government at the moment. And uh, we are concerned, I'm personally concerned, with how benefits are taken away without much in the way of dealing with the actual issues of the, of the person or the family concerned. I've been very, very keen on, and I'm very, very pleased that charities do support people in this situation. Again, we can, I can only talk about personal experience, and we have a family member who has a disability living allowance, and he understands that, and we help him with it. But of course, it's when it changes to pets, as it, as it will do in the future, we need to be able to explain that. So I do understand the issue, and, and the, the change in the benefit system is something that we need to address and work with. Charity work is very important, and uh, the, we need to make sure that there's jobs for people. I mean, uh, from a political standpoint, standing here as a prospective MP, what I'd say to you in trying to address this problem, which is obviously a national issue, is to make sure that work, there, is a, there is work for everyone. On that basis, people can have their own salaries, their own support, and not rely on food banks. It's a very simple statement. We need to make sure the economy is strong, and that your MPs work for you. It's not an easy solution. Uh, food banks shows that people are in desperate measures. It's undeniable. But we need to work positively, look to the future, and make sure there is work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brian Oakridge, please. Thank you. Despite the protestations of, of the coalition, it is, I, I, I do agree with some of the other speakers here, that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. We must remember that amongst the poor, and not just those on, on benefits, but also the low pay, that in certain parts of the country, effectively, the minimum wage is becoming the maximum wage because of wage compression at the bottom end. Too many people with the, the open door that there is from Europe competing for too few jobs. And we have a million young people in Britain out of work who ought to be in work. So also another pressure then on people at the bottom of the pile who are not seeing the benefits of the um, economic recovery that is, that is being touted are, are, uh, are the, the rising prices of I know food perhaps has dropped a little, but generally, amongst poorer households, two items figure very highly in, in their costs. That's food and energy. And we mustn't forget that energy costs have risen rapidly since the Climate Change Act of 2008, introduced by Labour, which has introduced all the green subsidies and so forth, which has hit poorer households extremely hard. And we would it repeal the Climate Change Act and introduce common sense energy policy. Um, also, on, on food banks themselves, um, we recognise them as being a focal point of 
people with financial problems and we would introduce um, debt and other problem counsellors into those to assist people with, with perhaps the root problems of why they're there. Thank you. Thank you. Jump on the Yes, I would say this is one of the great moral issues of our time. It cannot be right that the super rich in this country are doing so fabulously well while we've got nearly a million people in the last year depending upon food banks. That's absolutely wrong. I mean, how do I actually explain it to people? Perhaps if those people who think it's right to cut benefits and sanction people who perhaps in some instances don't even understand how the system works and they then have to go and depend upon a food bank in order to feed their families, perhaps those people who think it's right to cut taxes and hit the poor, maybe they should be compelled to go and do voluntary work in the food banks and talk to people who have to go through that, who have to endure that, to endure that misery. Perhaps the politicians who cause this to happen should go and work voluntarily on a voluntary basis in the government, and then maybe they'd understand why people are in that position. Perhaps then we'd have a sensible reform to our benefit system in the UK that we so desperately need. There's no getting away from this issue, though. Um, the richest 2,500 people in this country, at the time of the financial crash, they had the same wealth as the, the poorest 5 million people. Despite the financial crash, they did fabulously well. Then those 2,500 people have the same wealth now as the poorest 8 million people. The super rich have been given tax cuts. The super rich have been helped continuously by the poorest section of this, uh, uh, of this country have been hammered, and they've been hammered hard. And I, 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 certainly in the Green Party, um, I, we would argue that our approach to this is very different indeed to the other parties on this top level, because we are absolutely all about saying that taxation is the first run on the ladder to civilization. And if people don't understand that, they need to think long and hard about the moral compass and where it's taking them. Thank you. <laughs> Julian Whalen, please. It's, uh, it, it seems incomprehensible that we live in a country, depending on which way you measure it, which is either sixth or seventh wealthiest in the world. I guess in the 21st century, we're having more and more people dependent on charity. Um, you know, that's not lucky charity, but it is a damning indictment of where we are. But clearly, the reason that so many are dependent on food banks is because of poverty. Uh, and the growing gap, uh, a lot of the growing gap between the wealthiest and the poorest has clearly got to be tackled. I am not for a minute looking to start introducing the politics of anything, but, the, but I am about to start talking about the politics of fairness. One of the things that I would wish to see if elected as your Member of Parliament is something called the living wage. Quite clearly the, the, the wages, quite clearly the wages at the moment are uh, whilst better than, than when we, before the introduction of the minimum wage when people were earning as little as 50p an hour, uh, are, 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 it has served its time. And we now need to look at uplifting that because uh, the people, uh, one of the amazing things about food banks is not just serving those who can't find work, but they're serving people in work uh, and there's been a chronic failure. I do think as well that we've had a government who's seen the ills of the bankers and yet visited revenge, if that's, that's the appropriate word, on the poorest in our society. Uh, we have to have, we have to do something about poverty. I don't pretend it's an easy solution, but I think that a start as a living wage would be a good start. Thank you very much. <laughs> Question three is around. Uh, oh, I apologise. Oh, it's David. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's happening. Uh, sorry. About that. Um, one family is struggling to make ends meet is one family too many. And uh, I recently met uh, Rick Rhodes, who is the Essex District Manager for the Department of Work and Pensions, about this specific issue. And if anyone wants to see me afterwards, I'd be very glad to put you in contact with this gentleman. But uh, to answer the question, he gave me the following reasons for the use of these um, food outlets. 31% was as a result of benefit delays, 20% was the result of low income, 17% was as the result of benefit changes, 
7.9% the result of debt and 4% the result of being unemployed. Ladies and gentlemen, in this day and age, I didn't agree entirely with what Summer said earlier because food, I would have thought, other than Tesco, is, is, is coming down in price all the time. I mean, in this day and age, for people not to be provided with enough money to buy food is absolutely ridiculous. And if the benefit and support system is working properly, this is what the district manager has said, there would be no need for anyone to use these outlets. But I want to, I mean, they started in America. They've been going for a long time. And I wish to pay tribute to the churches and the voluntary organizations for providing these outlets. But I'm absolutely certain as the administration of the benefit system improves, and the economy recovers, I, I believe there will be less use of these food outlets. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and again, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so, we do come to the third question, which is around the question of austerity. The coalition saw it as a priority to drive down the country's deficit. Do you feel that this should remain a priority, and if so, how will your party ensure that those who are the most vulnerable in our society are not the worst affected? Uh, Julian Wehrlein, please. <coughs> my apologies, by the way. I do have a stinking cold, so uh, if you blow my nose, I do apologise. Um, clearly, a, a government has to balance the books. Uh, that's a no-brainer. And um, whilst I'm not a fan of austerity in any means, by any means, I do understand that we have to take certain measures. I would argue with the current government's way of doing that, which in my opinion has targeted the cuts in the wrong places and has gone far too deep, but I still understand the need to do that. And a Labour government has committed to balancing the books and to reducing the deficit. As, as I said, the emphasis would be different. Uh, reduction in poverty, well I think I covered that in part in my last answer. Uh, we're looking to a minimum wage. I think we'd also look to a, a, a welfare system which is fair and not seeking to punish those who really because they're unemployed, uh, disabled or falling on, on hard times. Um, in 2007, up to 2007, it's very difficult to remember the world before 2007 for some of us, but up to that point we were witnessing the, the longest sustained period of growth in the history of this country. Uh, inherited a, a, a bit of from John Major, but carried on by a Labour government. What has happened since then, of course, is a tremendous international wealth financial crash, and uh, that's where we are today. But we've got to address that, we've got to take the country forward, we've got to have a balanced economy that works for everyone, and, uh, you know, and for tackling poverty, tackling poverty has got to be a priority, and it's certainly a priority for me. Thank you. <laughs> so, David Anders. Well, as far as the economy is concerned, it was in a terrible state in 2010. And there is no doubt at all that it is recovering. And I didn't agree with what was said earlier. The 20% richest people are paying much more than the 80% rest of the nation. And that is exactly as it should be. But ladies and gentlemen, Unless the economy is sorted out, we cannot provide any public services at all. And the situation in 2010, with unemployment at 2.47 million, uh, JSA claimants 1.49 million, inflation at 3.3%, deficit at 10.2%, average weekly earnings £459. Now, I'm very pleased to say, that we've cut unemployment by 1.86 million. Average households will be 900 pounds better off in 2015. Youth unemployment has been cut by 743,000. Inflation is at zero. The deficit has actually uh, been halved and average weekly earnings are 474 pounds. Not only that, um, we are going to take more people out of tax at the bottom end than ever before. Um, and the whole emphasis of my party will be on making sure that the most vulnerable people in society do not suffer as the economy recovers. 
Right, yes, I touched on the scale of inequality a few minutes ago, and uh, on taxation, that's an incredibly important issue. And um, the Green Party will set out a very different agenda indeed to what you've heard. Um, as I say, we should be proud of our taxes, particularly if we're doing very exceptionally well. And that is one of the primary ways in which we, uh, we tackle uh, the deficit and also provide for those in need. So we propose a wealth tax on the richest 1% of uh, people in this country, people with assets over £3 million. Pounds. We propose raising the income tax on those earning more than £100,000 per annum. We propose introducing two new bans in council tax for the very largest properties. What's happened in the UK is that we've transferred a huge amount of wealth away from the great mass of people and put it into hands of the super rich. We need a correction, and I'm going to tell you right now, clearly, categorically, the Green Party is that correction. The injustices that have occurred, we will start to put right, if you elect us. Now, when it um, comes to um, uh, the, the deficit, the scale of the deficit, I think it's incredibly important to remember that uh, uh, after the Second World War, when this country was on its knees, you think how much we achieved, this nation achieved immediately after the Second World War, when it had far greater debts than it has now. As far as I'm concerned, a lot of people uh, uh, in the Green Party would argue that the austerity program has been an excuse to drive down the size of the state. Um, in uh, uh, currently, the scale of uh, GDP spent on public services and goods in the public sector is 39% of our economy, 39% of GDP. Um, it's project projected to go down to 36% over the next four years. In Germany, the size of the public sector is 45%. And what the Green Party is proposing to do is to get that back up to the same level as the German economy, a very successful economy. Uh, 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 an economy that cares far more for the poorest in society. And we, if you let us, we will do that job. Thank you very much. Paul Paul. The economy is run in this country, and it has done for the last three years, on the basis of a, a deficit. We work on the principle of the gross domestic output uh, and how much our deficit is. Now, we can ground the numbers around, but I saw numbers recently that we're around 80% compared, which is actually very similar to Germany. The coalition government has indeed reduced the deficit on its budget by half, and the Liberal Democrats, for its manifesto going forward, has put in plans, costed plans, which actually have been uh, proven and uh, was most transparent amongst all the parties by 2018. We indeed want to bring in the national tax. We do believe those at the higher end should pay a bit more. And we've identified where that money is going to go. And we may talk about NHS later, if not, I'll mention it now. That sort of money should be going into the NHS to increase that by £8 billion pounds a year for the next five years. We need to make sure as politicians that we do indeed have a working economy that is not out of control, as some of the economies are in the Far East, for example. And Japan's running at 200% of its GDP, totally unsustainable. So we need to be realistic. We need to be realistic with our economy that is fair. But also we need to make sure the infrastructure is there for our future generations. So the Liberal Democrats take the view that it's a balanced approach for the next five years. It is raising taxes where possible, on mansion tax for example, and being fair on where those reductions in the deficit to make sure our borrowings are not out of line with Germany and other similar Western European countries. We want to be positive and our plans have been costed and transparent and are fair. Thank you. Thank you. And why not 50? I agree entirely with the opening statement of June that the books must be balanced. But let me remind you just how big a mountain that is to climb. The debt at the moment is 1.5 trillion. The annual deficit is 90 <coughs> billion. That is worth 23,500 for every man, woman, and child in this country. However, we mustn't aim to reduce that without protecting the most vulnerable. And I believe our party has a, a, a unique selling point, a USP, those of you in business, um, in, of, of an offering to the British public. By coming out of the EU, we can save £10 billion a year. There's also a vast amount of waste in foreign aid. There has been an unholy rush this last financial year. Please bear me out. There's been an unholy rush to get rid of the budget that has been allocated 
and in the last couple of months, money has been pushed out on just poorly thought out projects with considerable risk of that money ending up in dictators' bank accounts. We agree that humanitarian aid such as Kathmandu going on now, yes, absolutely, there has to be spending and generous spending on that. But we believe that £10 billion pounds can be found there, £4 billion from cancelling HS2, which will just benefit a few businessmen getting 20 minutes quicker from one place to another, and scrapping the Barnet formula, which will give a fair allocation of money across the United Kingdom. With that £30 billion pound of painless cuts to British citizens, we can invest in the NHS. We have offered £3 billion, pound, which is funded as opposed to unfunded pledges. We will take minimum wage earners out of income tax. We will um, unscrap the ATOS scheme, replacing it with a GP vote. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, Brian has introduced us nicely to our next question, which is actually on foreign aid. A fundamental value of the Christian faith is neighbourliness. Many Christians want to see our country's leaders embodying that neighbourliness towards people of other countries where the needs are far greater than our own. What do the candidates consider to be our responsibility as one of the richest nations in the world towards the poor and oppressed people in other countries? Julian Whelan, please. <clears throat> Well, the answer our responsibility, I, as in my beliefs, I clearly think that those with the broadest shoulders should bear the greatest burden. Uh, not just referring to tax regimes here in the United Kingdom, uh, but as the world, uh, we are in a shrinking world. Uh, and if you want to be selfish about it, you can argue quite clearly that what goes on in other parts of the world does have a direct influence here. I'm guessing a distinctly uneasy feeling that the gentleman to my left is going to answer every question with a reference to immigrants, media, or foreign aid. Um, foreign aid is a good thing. Currently, our commitment is to 0.7% of gross domestic product. Uh, this bears fruit in a number of ways, not least of which, of course, is making people around the world uh, attempting to make their lives better. I wouldn't make the argument that every penny of foreign aid is spent wisely. Uh, but I'd rather see money spent on foreign aid than some other things. Um, our responsibilities are to ensure that all people around the world are in safety, have access to clean water, can be educated, and can be fed. And it is an irony that we are, whilst we're seeing mass starvation in parts of the world, we do have enough food produced currently to feed everyone. And one of the things that is happening here in the UK is that despite the prevalence of food banks, so we still see, still see an awful lot of food thrown away. I ultimately would like to see our foreign aid budget modestly increase. Whether that's possible over the lifetime of the next government, I really don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I think we must reinvent that budget. I think it's an, it's an important thing about the, uh, about the British people where we see our responsibilities. I do think that if we're looking at things like immigration, terrorism, and things like this as well, it's in our personal interest to make these countries help wealthier, prosperous, and more stable. Thank you very much. <laughs> so there it is. Well, canvassing, it certainly <coughs> is an issue with a number of people on the doorstep. And I understand what people are saying. Um, but having had the opportunity to travel throughout the world, this country is relatively wealthy in comparison to most other countries. And I think it is right, and indeed in our own self-interest, that when we're able to, we do help others. But I did think, ladies and gentlemen, that when we decided to uh, spend 0.7% um, of our GDP on foreign aid, this might be a hostage to fortune, and it would mean that people would say, Oh, it's too much. Well, I hope in the good times we can even give more. But I do understand there are a number of people who think we give too much. Well, it was the Prime Minister who decided that we would be the first year country to spend 0.7% of our national income 
on international aid, and this has been enshrined into law. So we'll have to see what will happen after the next parliament meets. And that has meant that 10 million children get the food that they actually need. Uh, we've improved nutrition for uh, 50 million people, enabled 11 million children to attend school. We've helped 60 million people get access to clean water and sanitation. And by 2020, we will save an estimated 1.4 million children's lives by immunising 76 million children against killer diseases. Now, if you were to ask me how Britishness is characterised, it is one of generosity. And I do applaud the way all the churches have worked together on that. So when you think of the present disaster in um, Everest, I'm sure the British people will rally around just as they did to help the Philippines and the tsunami. Thank you very much. Brian Oakridge, please. We've had questions already this evening about problems at home for those at the bottom end of society. Homelessness, food banks, the impact of austerity. And here we are moving on to talking about Britain helping the rest of the world. And I must stress that our, our position isn't one of harmlessness. As I said in earlier, we would support uh, Kathmandu. The example Sir David has just quoted of immunisation, water supplies and so forth. Yes, absolutely, all those kind of projects need supporting. But what we are also doing is this buying influence, which usually means buying off the rulers of these countries, and a lot of the money has been proven to be going in that direction. We are talking about matching the USA's, the USA's contribution in terms of a percentage of GDP. Um, and the other thing that we would do is we believe that the way to help these countries, and part of, this is, yes, part of coming out of the EU, re-establishing links with the Commonwealth, the, the vast number of the member countries being third world, who are often aid recipients, of actually developing trade with those and other nations. And we believe in trade, not aid. And I'll remind you of a well-known saying, give a man a fish, you can feed him for a day. Give a man a fishing rod and teach him how to fish, you can feed him for life. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so David, I said a lot of what I'm going to say now, but I will add a few more points to it, particularly from the Liberal Democrats aspect. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the manifesto tonight, but I have got one line here that I want to read to you that I firmly believe in. We believe in British foreign policy and should seek to promote peace, advance human rights, democracy and trade throughout the world and counsel the global threat to climate change. We commit to continue to meet the 0.7 of gross national income to overseas, and this is something the Liberal Democrats have fought for over the last five years to maintain with our Conservative colleagues in coalition, because not all the Conservative MPs wanted to agree to this. The coalition has had a lot of uh, issues from the press and the public saying that we've not been very good at certain things. The Liberal Democrats have added an aspect to this that I'm very proud of. I'm very proud it's going to go into law, and it's something I personally would love to support. It does all good. We are a modern world, and we need to make sure that our foreign policy is supported, and we should support those that need help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is going to be a first for me. Uh, I'm going to congratulate Sir um, David Cameron on taking the stance that he did. <laughs> Uh, because he, he did indeed face an awful lot of uh, obstacles within his party to maintain that 0.7 um, GDP commitment. Uh, so he is to be commended for that because that was not an easy decision. Um, turning to the general point though, um, uh, the Green Party actually recognises that um, uh, we live in very, very worrying international times. I mentioned earlier climate change, to point, briefly mention two points on that because it's crucial to understand what's going to happen in this world over the coming decades. By 2020, we're told that parts of Africa will suffer um, a 50% reduction in agricultural production. And by 2030, we're told that parts of Asia, particularly India, will suffer a 30% reduction in agricultural production. 
people are going to be on the move. People are going to be on the move like as never before. Migration is going to accelerate. It is absolutely vital that the developed world pay, pays its fair contribution towards helping people who are in fear of their lives, who may lose their lives due to ex extremes in climate. Now, uh, I've really got to take on the UKIP approach for this. If you slash foreign aid, if it is completely self-defeating, you are just going to make people in the poorest countries of the world even more desperate, sending more and more people in the direction of the United States of America and Europe. That is just what's going to happen. So it's, I, I just appalled by the UKIP stance on this. It is completely self-defeating. In fact, what we need to be doing is increasing um, our revenue to about 1% of GDP. Um, of course, we'd all love to do more, but there is just no getting away from this. If we do not help the world's poorest over the coming decades, we will see the most appalling chaos in this world. And it's something that nobody in this room will want to see or be a part of. Thank you very much. Now, we began to talk then about migration, so let's talk about immigration. The Bible's point, uh, the, the Bible's view of the just society is one that welcomes the stranger and alien, or in our language, the immigrant. There seems to be a concern that should we welcome immigrants, our country will become overcrowded. Is this concern reasonable, and what do you consider to be the just approach to this issue? So there you go. Well, this, without any question, is an issue on the doorstep. I was just telling my colleagues before we started, uh, first time ever, uh, I've been called a white racist. So um, I think this is definitely an issue that uh, is on a number of people's minds. And of course, the population of our country has increased over the last two decades. There is no doubt at all about that. And we are a relatively tiny island. And uh, most of the people are coming to the south and the southeast of our country. <coughs> but I say again, we are a compassionate country. And the figures of people coming to this country from non-EU nations is falling. But for those people who are concerned about the numbers overall, Nothing can be done, and any politician who says otherwise, unless you renegotiate our membership of the European Union. That is the reality of it all. And I really feel when we think of those people fleeing from persecution at the moment, whether it be what's going on in Libya, they are in terrible situations. And we can remember what happened with Mugabe and the people uh, coming over from Zimbabwe. We are compassionate people, but I think it is right that we talk about it, because certainly there are many, many people who are concerned. Not, it's nothing at all to do with the colour of the person. It's about simply the numbers of people that we have in the country and how we can support services. And as we've already heard, it's only now that we have a recovering economy that I think people will be able to feel better about their future. So this is an important issue, and we politicians mustn't duck it. Thank you very much. <laughs> should we welcome strangers? Yes, we should. And one of the things that I find uh, irks at the times is the uh, conflation of immigration, asylum, and re uh, refugees. Mm. Um, is the country full up? That's an interesting uh, question actually and um, the answer to that actually is no but it does depend on where you what you consider full up. The problem is when you set an absolute number this, uh, and, and you draw, pull up the drawbridge, you know, stop everyone coming in, you're not going to stop population growth. Uh, you leave one be like to be one river and some of those people can, who, would, who are a glass at the moment of this country are planning a coal at some point in the future. There is something like 2.2 million Britons currently living, working in Europe as well. So a send them back policy may not necessarily see a, 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 a drop in the population of this country. We need a, a fair immigration system. I don't think that 
completely flying open the doors and allowing anyone to come here, necessarily benefiting those who wish to come here or those who are here, but to unfairly label that all the ills of society on those who come here to better themselves is, is my opinion, completely uh, wrong and unfair. We should welcome strangers. Our country is richer for immigration. Uh, we ourselves, you know, many of us, for those of us who study our family trees, or even see immigrants in our own, uh, in our own ancestry. I have a Belgian grandfather uh, who came here because of, because of a war, First World War, and I'm entirely grateful that uh, he fell in love with, A, fell in love with a British woman, but also that the British were so welcoming. And I think also that some of the arguments on immigration denies British history, because, you know, we used to proudly say that the sun never set our empire, we could see our world map with a lot of pink in it, but that didn't happen by being an inward-looking, uh, <coughs> introverse, introspective nation that came back with the embrace of the world, and I think we should continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give you a different sort of uh, image, if you like, of uh, immigration. Um, the Office of Budget Responsibility say that um, the uh, UK economy is growing primarily because of the uh, scale of immigration into the UK. Um, if the scale of immigration is significantly higher than the Conservatives' uh, target of 100,000, and it's for that very reason that the uh, number of people coming to the UK is much higher, that the economy is growing. Um, so it's very important to understand just uh, what is the cause of the um, recovery that we're told is going on. Um, now, when we think also in terms of people who come to this country, invariably people who come here are younger on average. 17.2% um, of migrants have launched their own business compared with 10.4% of UK born individuals. They're also on average eight years younger. Uh, immigrants have started or co-founded 14.4% of businesses in the UK, and these businesses have created 1.1 million jobs. So that's a different perspective, perhaps, to the one that you hear in the media. Uh, but a special word of Katie Hopkins in the Sun and her cockroaches approach to people who need to migrate. Uh, that is, um, I'm quoting the Guardian here, that is the language of genocide, and none of us must have any truck with that. And every time you hear something to say, racist about immigrants, or generalising about immigrants, every single one of us in this room has a duty to chunk them and say, no, you will not stand for that. <laughs> I have to start by saying that in no way would our party dishonour the UN obligations on refugees and asylum. That door still remains open. Nor would we dishonour the, the, the right of people who are, are settled to bring in marriage partners, although we would increase uh, the checks to ensure that these sham marriages that we hear about uh, don't occur. There will also be no sending back of anyone. If they are here, they are here already. They can stay. We are talking about dealing with the numbers problem that Sir David talked about. We, Britain, was extremely welcoming to immigrants in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and through into the 80s. The numbers were in five figures. And I'm not talking about targets. De facto, it was 30 to 50,000. The numbers now, since the 90s, have been going into six figures. And I will draw the parallel. You might invite one person into your house and be extremely welcoming. And you can absorb them. You have a spare bedroom. You can feed them. But if they start saying, well, can I bring my wife and my brother and my sister and my parents and my children along as well, and you end up with ten of them, it starts getting a bit of a strain. And, okay. and that is where we, we are going. We cannot plan when we don't know how many are coming. Also, our government despite all this alleged extra income, doesn't actually have any more money. The deficit is still there and don't have the money to invest in the new schools, hospitals, roads, housing and other infrastructure which is needed to cater for all these people. And that is the basic problem. If humanity can remain, we must control the numbers. 
And pull columns, please. Thank you. I totally apologise for you. Um, it's, it's, um, Brian and I have shared the stages on a couple of occasions of previous evening. We all seem to be disagreeing on some things, and this is a major issue. Migration of peoples working around Europe is very important. It's important to me, and I hope important to a lot of people in this country. Mr. Fuller is absolutely right in what he said to you there. I absolutely agree with him. Without those people coming in, setting up businesses, paying taxes, we would have a real problem in this country, and it is something that we should welcome. We should not stigmatise those people we do not necessarily understand straight away. It's a very easy target, and we should stand up against it. Mr. Fuller is absolutely right. I will always stand against what you stand for. It is absolutely anti to my grain. We have people in this country who are here because they want to work hard for themselves and their family, and they contribute. I welcome that wholeheartedly. We have people also in this country who go to other countries to work, and that is great as well in Europe. And I would want to support that to continue that. Now, Europe may come this, I hope it does later, because I am very proud of the European. I want to continue with that too. I just, just, just get so upset about Egypt sometimes. The way it brings in other people as some sort of fear factor to get people to think of their way. It is wrong, and I would say morally wrong. I won't say that too many times tonight, and I apologise to the church for saying that, but I really do feel strongly. And I welcome people, and it's to our benefit that they're here. Thank you. Right, well, let's move on from immigration. We're talking about defence, and particularly Trident. What's your party's policy and your personal view, if they differ, in relation to Trident and working towards a world free of nuclear weapons. When £1 billion can pay for 26,000 nurses for a year or 12,000 hospital doctors, do you believe that the £25 billion Trident renewal programme is necessary and justifiable? Paul Collins, please. I'm glad, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to talk about party policies and my opinion straight afterwards, sir, because they're not the same. Um, the party policy is to try and to find a cheaper option and to wind down Trident. I want to scrap Trident. It is something I feel very strongly about, and I see no future for it whatsoever. I hear the question, I've had it quite a few times as Stan as a candidate, lots of emails, people contacting me asking, is it right that we should spend this money in this sort of funds? That's not relevant to me. What is relevant? We shouldn't actually have it at all, whatever the cost might be. I personally feel Trident is wrong and we should be scrapping it. Now, the party policy is different to mine, so I was allowed that by the chairman to say that. It is a more of a wind down issue. But if I was your MP, I would be standing up saying, no, it has to be scrapped. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> John yes, thank you. Actually, I've got uh, a figure of 100 billion. Okay. Over the last 30 year lifetime of the uh, pro Trident project, if it is uh, renewed, it's absolutely eye watering amount of money, absolutely phenomenal. But that isn't really the key issue, although scrapping it really does allow us to do an awful lot of better things with that. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, Germany and Japan have never been attacked. Nobody's launched a nuclear strike upon them because they haven't got Trident, they haven't got nuclear weapons. The greatest threat we face now is potentially somebody flying a plane into one of our nuclear power stations some of the Green Party would rather we didn't have. But if somebody did, who are we going to bomb? Who are we going to pick out? What nation? There isn't a nation. There's nobody we can bomb. Those weapons are going to be completely and utterly useless. We spend a hundred billion pounds to achieve nothing. Quite apart from the fact, I completely agree with Paul, quite apart from the fact it's a moral, it's an immoral weapon, quite apart from that, it is completely and utterly impractical. There's so much more that we could be doing, so much more we could be achieving with that money. Um, I think that everybody in Parliament should um, seriously analyse what you actually think you're going to be achieving with the Trident weapon, because it's just of no use whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it would be a wonderful world if the whole world could be rid of nuclear weapons. If there could be, if, if, one could negotiate with the major powers to dismantle every single one. But remember, there's Russia, China, India, um, uh, 
Israel, for example, all have nuclear weapons already. And what do you do with them? How do you prevent them from leaking out to terrorist organizations? So the reality is, it's a dangerous world, and there will be nuclear weapons out there for a long time. And I have to say, yes, our party policy, and I'm only parroting it, says that we agree with, with the present uh, government and, and that it should be renewed. On a personal level, I believe that, there, I, it, that without the standoff of the Cold War, and I'm a Cold War warrior, I was in the Air Force during the Cold War, lived with the fear of that uh, a war, a conflict on the inner German border turning into a worldwide nuclear war. Um, that in the modern kind of threat where the attack could be from a rogue state, one perhaps needs a more flexible option than that which Trident offers, which is a, a, a massive retaliation. Um, therefore, I feel that if, if it is possible to conduct a study to look at uh, less um, aggressive, less uh, impacting options, I believe that's the way to go. But I believe as well that we must defend ourselves in what is becoming an even more dangerous world. Thank you. Sir David. It is one of the primary responsibilities of a government to make sure that its people are well defended. And much as we all dislike the thought of nuclear weapons being used, and we can uh, look to history and see what happened in the Second World War, in a more uncertain world environment, it would be utterly irresponsible to deny that we shouldn't be having an independent nuclear deterrent. Absolutely irresponsible. That idiot Blair got the wrong place, Iraq, rather than Iran, who had nuclear weapons, and we all know what is going on in Korea. So this is a more dangerous and unstable environment in which we live. And it would be absolutely irresponsible for a government to do away with it. So we would replace Trident to maintain continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent. In 2010, the Strategic Defence and Security Review, the government confirmed its commitment to maintain a continuous submarine base deterrent and to begin the work of replacing its existing submarines. It was agreed that the Liberals would continue to make the case for the alternatives. So as a result, in 2011, the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister jointly commissioned the Cabinet Office officials to conduct a focus review into alternative systems and postures. But it would be absolutely irresponsible for any government not to make sure that its citizens at this critical time are not properly defended. Yeah. <laughs> Julian Werner, please. I'm not sure anyone's arguing that we completely rid ourselves of our defences. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not. Um, we are, to David's correct, we have to defend ourselves. Um, but it seems to me that a hundred billion spent on replacing something we've never used with something we're not going to use, particularly in the current economic climate, is at least questionable. I would like to see uh, greater moves towards less nuclear proliferation. I'm not arguing for a, a complete abandonment of nuclear weapons at the moment, because I do understand that we, in a world where other nations have them, we, we need to be able to have some credible uh, alternative to, to what we've got. But I, but I do think that if pushed to vote tomorrow on it, I would vote for its replacement. Uh, it's my idea, of course, that this government also sh at the moment shrinking the size of our armed forces. So, uh, you know, we are seeing a, a, a alternatives to nuclear weapons which you won't use, but we've got nothing there to, 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 to back up some of the things that we want to do in terms of policing, uh, protecting ourselves and policing the world. <laughs> It is, it is a difficult argument. I mean, I don't pretend that it's a simple solution. Um, and one of the things that we've asked about was Labour Party policy. I, I think, to be, to be fair, the Labour Party is pretty split on this. Uh, whilst I think, uh, I think there's a commitment to making sure that we're protected, an awful lot of Labour parliamentary candidates and uh, members of Parliament, as were, are, are, are very uneasy about spending a huge amount of money uh, on something which we will never likely to use. Thank you. Thank you.
Right, let's change tack slightly. Um, indeed, completely, really. We're going to the NHS. And in a society in which we are living longer, and medical science is providing ever greater advances in medical care, how do we protect the National Health Service, which is the envy of the world, and from where will the money come to pay for it? Prior to already uh, made reference to this, we have made a, a total commitment to the NHS. We said that we would put three billion pounds a year into it right from the word go to um, ensure that it can continue uh, at uh, free at, at the point of use. We've got a lot of other policies. I mean, that, that would buy more nurses and doctors. And yes, a lot of those nurses and doctors would have to come from, from overseas. And yes, if they were skills that this country needed, the door would still be open. However, we also, what has happened is there's been a massive reduction in the um, training cap uh, offerings that we have for doctors and nurses in Britain. We would want to expand those training opportunities for, for people within the UK to, to move in, into that profession. Another major problem with the NHS is the integration with social care, particularly with elderly people. We've all heard of the expression bed blocking. It is a real problem. The fact that there is not enough joined up thinking between the NHS and the councils who run social care means that uh, a patient is effectively discharged from hospital, but there's nowhere to go for them for care. And we want to solve that problem by actually bringing the, the management of social care back, back into the, uh, under the umbrella of the NHS to ensure that the pathways system, which is already being used in our hospitals, to smooth the path of the patient through all the various steps of their care is then extended out into the social care uh, arena as well. Thank you. Thank you. John. Okay, um, National Health Service, I think it perhaps boils down to one word, and that's socialism. I think that if you want to see whether a candidate actually genuinely supports the National Health Service or not, ask them whether they're a socialist. Because that brings out straight away one crucial point. The National Health Service is the envy of the world. It is one of the most efficient health services, services in the world. And of course it is founded on socialist principles something that's incredibly difficult to do, but we do it together, we do it jointly. The market mechanism does not belong in the NHS. First thing that we must do in order to save our NHS and to cope with the demands of the future is put right what's gone wrong. We need to repeal the Health and Social Care Act and we need to introduce a Green Party's proposal an NHS reinstatement bill, which will remove the market mechanism from the NHS. Now, when you're talking to candidates on the doorstep, if you care passionately about the NHS, and I know most people do, ask them that simple question. Are you a socialist? Because that will lead you through to the truth about whether they really care about the NHS or not. Do they want to privatise it? Do they want to increase the speed of privatisation? Or do they want to um, support it? Now, Brian Oatridge and I did something together, actually, uh, unusual for us, but we did. We went along to a 38 degrees event yesterday, and in this constituency, 2,300 plus people signed an online petition for 38 degrees, demanding to know what the candidates are going to do to save the NHS. It's the biggest issue, actually, in this town, it would seem. No um, issue is greater or has greater priority in this constituency than the desire of people to save the NHS. Um, so we met people, and they wanted to know whether we were going to um, fund it properly, how much money we were going to put in, what we were going to do to sort out prioritisation. Uh, the Green Party, and our time's growing up here, but we're pledging an additional £12 billion. Pounds, and I mentioned earlier on about how we we're going to raise taxes in order to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Julian Weatherly, please. I think I'm the only person here who probably answered John Fuller's question in the affirmative. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I am a socialist, so that's uh, what you're wondering. Um, I'm very proud that post 
the Second World War, it was Cabinet Act, the Labour government that created the National Health Service, and it pushed to make the greatest achievement by this country in the last century. I think that what we did in 1948 would be it. Uh, big effort, defeated the fascism. There's nothing more precious than our health. You can speak to anyone, the amount of money they've got, I think they give it all away from it to their own life. We've got to, you know, we've got to make sure it's fully and properly funded free at the point of delivery. Uh, the Labour Party is proposing a mansion tax and a levy on tobacco companies. I don't, I, unlike our, my friends here, I haven't bought loads and loads of notes, so I, I can't quote verbatim from about a manifesto, but there is definitely a commitment to create something called a time to care fund. We need to, I mean, I'm very proud that I inherited in 1997 uh, a, a National Health Service and our public services on the need. Uh, the, Labour, the then Labour government managed to reduce waiting lists down from 18 months to 18 weeks. We managed to introduce an extra 80,000 nurses, more 50,000 more doctors, and also saw uh, the continuing uh, improvements in longevity. Uh, I think we need to do things about early diagnosis for cancer treatments. Uh, I think we need a care service as well. And I probably like a lot of the candidates here, I've signed all sorts of pledges about Alzheimer's, uh, motor neuron disease, etc., etc., etc. It is important that we have a national health service. It is something that we've got to keep going. I think there's a very real danger that if we were to give David Cameron another five years in government, we might see a radically changed, if not disappeared, national health service. Yes, the National Health Service, very much a touchstone of this campaign, and I think a touchstone of our lives. I think any of us in this room have had some issue or touch with family members or ourselves with the National Health Service and the wonderful service it provides us all. The Liberal Democrats quite early on in this campaign set out in their manifesto that we agreed with the Chief Executive who said to get the NHS properly funded if it needed eight billion a year for the next five years. We absolutely agreed with that and we all then set out the mansion tax which is mentioned by other people on this top table where we rearranged the tax bans for the uh, property tax where we can actually raise the money to pay for it. I'm also very pleased that the Democrats talked about mental health. I've raised it before and I'll raise it again because obviously you need to be able to spend money wisely and actually try and treat people before it becomes a much worse issue for them and us to deal with. Also, Mr. Roach has his picture on the point here about we need to buy some doctors and nurses. Absolutely, if it wasn't for migration, our National Health Service would be in a terrible state. So I wonder how we could possibly cope with the change there. But what I do feel very strongly about is that we need to make sure our young people are trained to be doctors and nurses. Now, this is a personal opinion, not party policy, so this isn't my opinion and I would certainly push for it amongst my party. We need to make sure we have good educational courses for our young people who want to become into that vocation of nursing and doctors, and make sure that it is available to them at a much better price, that they can afford and take it on. We need to have a national health service with money, and we said we'll do that. We also need a national health service with people there who care and actually can help us, much more important. South and Hospital's had issues, and I'm sure Mr. We may hear about that later as well. We need to look at the structure. The structure clearly isn't working properly when the hospital is being fined for not being able to cope with its A&E lists. And that money gets recycled purely amongst the uh, health groups in this town. It is not working properly. The hospital is working very hard. I've met people... Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, that's fine. I like all councils say, but we all support the NHS and we all want to do more. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Good <laughs> over. We have a wonderful National Health Service in this country and anyone who tries to run it down should be absolutely ashamed of themselves. I've been on the Health Select Committee for 10 years, been all over the world and our health service here is absolutely magnificent. And that is why my party in the last election pledged that they would increase spending on the National Health Service and it was increased by 3.5 billion pounds this is our manifesto. We will continue to increase spending on the NHS and we will provide a seven day a week access to your GP and deliver a truly seven day NHS. Because we can't have this ridiculous situation with 
if you're unfortunate enough to be ill on a Friday afternoon, then nothing really happens on a Monday. Our National Health Service is magnificent. And I hear from local residents in South End how top quality it is. But ladies and gentlemen, we do have an aging population. And that is something which no politicians have reg readily addressed, frankly. So there is an issue there. But I say again, our health service is the envy of the rest of the world and people who run it down should be absolutely ashamed of themselves. Yes, you should. Thank you all. Well, we're going to turn to change tack again and we're going to talk now about electoral reform. Uh, and this is a quote particularly from one of our younger uh, constituents. Many of my friends and a number of first-time voters that I know are disengaged in the democratic electoral process. Might electoral reform now be necessary to mobilise and motivate people to better engage in the democratic process? Sir David, please. Well, I have been pleading people to vote in the election and, of course, wanted to vote Conservative. But um, I, I'm going to be frank, I don't, I don't know if we've got the young people in, in the room here, but I personally am not in favour of reducing the age where people can vote to 16. Okay. I think 18 is about the right age. So if you to ask me, ladies and gentlemen, what's gone wrong here, I can tell you, in 1997, that was the moment when Parliament and politics changed. Because unfortunately, we had one party with a huge majority, and most of our powers were ceded to unelected quambos. So the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, we politicians now exist to be blamed for everything. When I was first elected in 1983, it was much easier to get things done than it is today. So is it any wonder that people are turned off of politics and politicians because we can no longer get things done as easily as we can? So how do we get young people engaged? Well, I'm delighted to say that our schools, through the school councils and through the mock elections, are beginning to reinvigorate politics. I stood in the 1964 mock election in my school and the 1966 mock election. So whatever party anyone supports, I think that is the, the uh, correct approach to things. It's very, very important that everyone votes in this election and that we make sure and encourage our young people to vote as well. Thank you. Thank you. Right, okay, well, we've got to clear it up straight away with that, Mr. Greens and the Conservative Party, because we would reduce the voting age to 16. I think that, uh, that is about the right age for uh, people to get engaged. Now, um, there are several reasons why people are switching off from politics. Um, most people you talk to would say that uh, we're all um, corrupt, that we can't be trusted, we're dishonest. That is, uh, generally speaking, one of the most fundamental uh, main messages you get from the public when you go around talking to them. People have uh, whole politicians in very low esteem. So there's a whole series of things that have actually got to be done to try and put that right. But to kick off with, I think we do need proportional representation so that people can actually go out and vote for parties that they believe instead of choosing the worst, least option. Um, and that is the brutal truth of the way an awful lot of people will vote when this election comes. So of course, um, the other problem is huge numbers of people coming at this general election, despite how incredibly important this one is for the future of our country, very large numbers of people will not vote. So, in addition to PR, I also think that we need to reform the House of Lords. We need to join, join the other advanced democracies of the world and actually have an elected second chamber. Seems a bit odd that our nation should be so far behind in that respect. Um, so, bring democracy to the UK. Um, and um, uh, the, other, the other issue would be thinking in terms of what actually turns people off about politics. Um, uh, I would say that probably it's the, one, one of the most important reasons that young people talked about why they're switching off from politics was what happened to the Lib Dems over tuition fees. Uh, I understand politics, I'm not daft, but I know how politics operates, and I think most people in this room do. But an awful lot of people, younger people, would just say, oh, what on earth is the point now? If we were betrayed over that tuition fee uh, pledge, then.
then what actually is the point of any advice at all? So that's an issue that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> UKIP does indeed believe that a vast amount of political reform is required, much of it in order to engage everyone, young and old. And I've been uh, in contact with some of the local school campaigns, the UKIP teams, obviously, and it has impressed me greatly how enthusiastic they are. Also, it was those students who themselves were 16 to 18 who did not agree with putting up the voting or putting it down to 16. They felt at the 16 to 18 age band, they ought to be getting better education in their responsibilities as citizens in terms of, of, of politics and governance of the country. But UKIP would introduce an easier method by which referendums could be held on key issues and we would have one by, by, as it were, popular vote of the issues, a referendum engaging the public every two years. We would also introduce recall, where a poorly performing MP, if enough people in their constituency sign a, a petition, there would then be a vote of confidence on them and they could be kicked out. Um, also giving a common select committee powers to veto senior ministerial civil service and quango appointments, but also, again, um, interestingly agreeing with the Greens again, we would also like to see a proportional representation system. The problem with the present system is um, now with so many parties, uh, coalitions are a thing of the future. The next government will be an even bigger coalition, as it were, in terms of numbers and parties than the last one, I, I predict. And the people want to see a fairer representation, and we would push for that PR voting system as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul Collins, please. Thank you. Going back to the question about getting engagement with young people, um, the political parties have a very important part to play here. Undoubtedly, the political parties have, have pandered to where they think the people are actually going to vote in the older generation. And their broadcasts and their policies, I'm afraid, are pointed towards that, and I regret that. We need to be able to talk to young people. We have, uh, as you know, a political student at 17 who says to me that he doesn't want to vote until he's 18. And I think that's probably about right that I'm happy to listen to people. I also think proportional notation is a very important point. Because in fact, if you want to engage people, if you want people to take part in your process, give them something when they vote that means something. Which means if you go across a region and a percentage of people vote a certain way, their representation, their voice will be heard in proportion to how they voted. Liberal Democrats, as you won't be surprised, tried to put through some sort of position through under A V, but unfortunately it was lost during 2010, 2015. That remains our position. If you want people to be engaged and to trust politicians, give them a voice and an opportunity to do so and let the vote speak actually mean something. Nick Clegg apologised for these student fees and was honest and apologised up front. I think integrity is very important. You hear it quite often that politicians are only for themselves. That is very, very sad and indictment on us all. We need to have more honesty, more truthfulness, and if things go wrong, say so. And I'm so pleased Nick Clegg did that. Thank you. I am a long-standing member of the Electoral Reform Society, uh, which I think probably gives you the answer, or, or let you know what I'm about, about to say. Uh, I believe in electoral reform in all its guises, uh, including uh, proportional representation, which I think we have a majority in this panel. Um, I do believe that uh, votes at 16 uh, is something I would support. I'm a part of that campaign too. On September the 18th last year, we had a referendum in Scotland regarding their independence. Uh, that was a referendum that allowed 16 year and 17 year olds to vote, North of the border, and the engagement of the turnout was extremely high. I don't think anyone would suggest that 16 and 17 year olds in that very important election voted frivolously or in ignorance. I think it, it really engaged them, and I think it's a testament to their maturity and to the arguments for voting at 16. Uh, you can go work, you can marry, you can start a family at 16, you can't vote, it doesn't seem quite right. But I would go further, I would also have a fully democratic House of Lords. I also think the way we vote needs modernising. I've certainly, 
like to see uh, explore the possibility of voting using the internet and, and other means. Um, our current first past the post system, which is an irony in name, because actually there is no post, it's just getting one more vote from the person in second place, dates back to the days to, to a Queen Anne style of politics where we had, we had two Whigs and Tories. Today we have a far more pluralistic system and yet our politics doesn't reflect that. This election, this election will be a good example. So yes, let's have electoral reform uh, and have it now. Thank you. The next area we'd like to talk about is Christians and faith in society. Faith communities contribute in numerous ways to the well-being of this society. We could cite many examples, preschools, debt reduction programs, parish nursing, um, and so on. What are your views on the place of faith groups in society, and how should they be encouraged and supported? Paul Collins. I think they are supported. I think uh, the communication and the work that they do is, is, is very, very important. Uh, I'm from Eastwood, and we have an Anna Baptist church up there that is close to where I live. And I'm very much aware of the work it does with the young community and the pastor and his wife, and how they support the community by when they themselves being at the government school that I'm the governor of. Being part of community is very, very important. How we can do more? Well, obviously, we need to make sure that charities work well, foundation works well, um, but one of the priorities engage more. Now, Southland Council's got a good record here with the charity sector, the third sector, and I'd want to encourage that to continue. <coughs> I think the churches themselves know exactly how they want to continue, so I don't think they need a politician necessarily to tell them, other than to be available, to listen to what your needs are, and respond accordingly. I would be driven by what your views are, and I wouldn't necessarily impose mine on yours. I welcome the work that you do, it's so, so important. I don't want to listen to more ideas you have. Thank you. Thank you. So David. Well, I was appalled at the previous public meeting that we had when, uh, as I saw it, uh, attacks were made on faith groups and faith schools. Now, this is a personal matter, but I do have a faith, and I cannot understand other politicians attacking people who have a faith, who are dedicated to doing good for the community. I just cannot understand it at all. So to answer the question, I think I applaud all the faith groups and organisations in this area. They do an absolutely magnificent job. In fact, we couldn't do without them. Although I was born a Catholic and I die Catholic, whatever the faith was, I have a faith. And I, I think they're absolutely wonderful. And instead of condemning people who have a faith, we should celebrate that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, I, I agree with 100% of what Sir David has said. We, we, the, the faith groups are extremely important for a number of reasons, and indeed the the sermon, the address from the um, Reverend, I, excuse me, I've forgotten his name, who spoke at the St. George's Day parade was, was very uh, moving in, in that respect, in that uh, the Christian, Deo Christian faith is absolutely central to our English culture. I say English because today we're celebrating St. George's Day. And uh, my party would not do anything to weaken that, indeed, we would want to, to strengthen it, to protect re religious freedom, but not condone, condoning extremism. Also, we would support the continuance of faith schools, which are a valuable education, not only to the education system, but to the whole structure of, of the British nation. Thank you. Julian Weyler. Earlier this afternoon, I was at one of the mosques in Leicester speaking to the imam and some of the, some of the adherents of that faith. Um, I have no faith, uh, it's not something which I've ever heard of, but my wife is a devout Christian. Um, but I think we are living in a society where we have multiplicity of faiths. 
I am, as I said, an introduction of a member of Amnesty International and a campaign for people to be able to practice their faiths across the world. Um, I think faith groups are important. I make no, I don't know who David today was referring to. I've got a feeling he might have been talking about me. I don't recall attacking people of faith, but some I certainly wouldn't do. Um, but I, I do believe in inclusiveness as well. I have no problems with faith groups of, uh, and existing in their own right at all and doing the good work they do, but I, I, I do have serious question marks about having distinct groups educated separately, and that's my uh, heartfelt belief. We are living, though, in an increasingly secular society, and whilst we must protect those who, for whatever religion they've got, we must also protect the rights of those who choose not to have a faith. So, uh, I think in conclusion, I think uh, I can say that I will to fight to my dying breath to protect those who, who wish to, to practice their religion, um, and, and, uh, and I support, completely support freedom of faith. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, it's like Julian appears to be in the um, same position here because we're both atheists and we um, uh, both did comments on faith scores at the last house meeting. Now, for people that weren't here, uh, I can absolutely categorically say that there was no attacking of other faiths and there was no condemning people for those faiths. No, that, no, that. The only, the only uh, issue we have in this community and throughout the UK as a whole, if they we're talking about attacking, is attacks upon the Muslim and church communities. That is the main issue that we have to face. Minority groups being attacked, and it's certainly not the case that Julian and I would attack anybody at all on the basis of their faith. I think we are both respectful of their, uh, people's faith and have the utmost respect for people's faith. But, speaking for myself, I do believe that as a society, I use the expression that we either integrate or we disintegrate. I think that we do face enormous pressures over the coming uh, decades. There's no doubt about that. We have to face up to those pressures, and part of that process is to integrate faith schools back into local authority control. And that is one of the issues where people in this community may disagree with me. That's fine, I accept that. There is absolutely no question at all that you, Julian and I, or I, have uh, in any way at all attacked anybody on the basis of their faith. Thank you very much. We're talking about being attacked on the basis of faith. Um, there's a question here on religious persecution, um, and it's phrased like this. In recent weeks, both David Cameron and Ed Miliband have highlighted the shocking incidents of Christians being persecuted and killed because of their faith, particularly in Syria, Iraq, Kenya, and most recently in Libya. What can be done to reduce the threat and alleviate the suffering of those who are targeted because of their faith? Brian Autry. To, uh, have to answer this one. It's a difficult one. It's, it, obviously, I agree totally that nobody of any faith should get persecuted because of that faith. And um, I feel for the people, the Christians in those countries, in Kenya and Syria, as much as any of you do here, I believe. And that Britain should certainly, and Nigel Farage has said this, have a special place in Britain for uh, asylum seekers of Christians from other countries who have particularly, because we are essentially a Christian society, that, that there should be a special place for them to, to, to come here for sanctuary. But there also needs to be clearly attempts to stabilize those parts of the world um, where that persecution is, is going on. And while we wouldn't want to see um, unnecessary interference in foreign countries. I do believe personally that uh, when there is persecution going on, perhaps our nation should consider some form of certainly military assistance to protect those people. Um, and in order to do that, however, we do need a strong defence force. Thank you. Thank you. John Fuller. Yes, um, there is no doubt at all that we do face on um, very unsettling times with rising intolerance across the world. A whole range of things that we can be doing, though, to alleviate the situation. People tonight on this top table have referred to some of our greatest foreign policy mistakes over the last few years. Uh, in Libya and in Iraq and Afghanistan, there have been huge mistakes made, and as a result of that, uh, nations have become increasingly unstable. 
and we have not made the necessary pl uh, plans we should have done to uh, ensure continuity of government after our interventions. So we've actually, in some respects, made matters a lot worse. Um, so we need to avoid making the policy disaster mistakes that we had in, in the past. Um, we need to think before we act. Um, we also do need to put pressure, though, on certain Middle Eastern countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, has a very a great deal of influence throughout the Middle East. It is a major player, and there's a lot more that we could be doing there to get the Saudi Arabian government to intervene to protect Christian communities throughout the Middle East. There's a lot that could be done. Um, but ultimately, sometimes in very, very unsettling times, very dangerous times, we do have to accept people here in this country who need to flee their nations and we need to give people asylum. So we in the Green Party are absolutely all about um, supporting asylum. We want to ensure that we possibly can that people stay in our own countries where they really want to be. But if they do need to flee, then we want to show humanity to people when they arrive in this country. We don't want to add persecution to them upon the persecution they've already suffered when they arrive here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. One, one, of the, uh, one of the themes, if you like, of my campaigning over the years is the, is the wish for more toleration. And one of the things I think is, unfortunately, has happened from time to time, it seems to be the rise of intolerant politics, um, not just abroad, but here in the UK too. Um, I think religious, I would utterly condemn religious persecution over here, and there is a persecution in parts going on in this country as well as broad, and one of the things I would hope for is that we would see, remain a refuge for those who are fleeing persecution. Um, what can we do directly about some of the hot spots in the world? Well, it is, it is a difficult question to, to answer, uh, and I'm certainly not prepared to give written replies, but I think one of the benefits in being part of a large organisation like the European Union, for example, is it gives, does give us more weight and more muscle in tackling some of these rogue states whether that be by sanctions or whatever. Um, we have got to, you know, as a campaigner for religious toleration and defending people's right to have faith, we've got to send a message out to the world that people should be allowed to have free voices, uh, public views, not just political, faith, whatever it is they've got. And we must utterly defend that because the minute we start shutting down people for their faith or their views, I think it's the slippery road to a very nasty place. Thank you. Uh, I do not support the thing. I'm not going yeah. to so, be heading of anyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, sorry, let's move on. Sir <laughs> David, please. <laughs> uh, there are many parliamentarians who constantly raise the issue of the persecution of Christians abroad. Uh, shortly after my election to Parliament, uh, I went, went on a trip to Moscow and uh, we successfully secured the release of a prisoner of conscience there called, I still can't pronounce it properly, Ogorolnikov. And uh, there are many, many active groups who campaign all the time in Parliament on these issues, and uh, they are by and large pretty effective. Uh, so my party believes that we should stand up for the freedom of people of religion to practice their beliefs in peace and safety. For example, by supporting persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Uh, we continually press governments in the Middle East and North Africa to ensure the protection of all, regardless of their religion or belief, and encourage them to develop inclusive political systems which represent all of its citizens. We also condemn the persecution of Christians and other minorities on the basis of their religion or belief or ethnicity. An inclusive Iraqi government, for instance, needs to uphold the rule of law and protect Iraqi's minority communities. In parallel, the United Kingdom is intensifying support for the Syrian moderate opposition who have a pluralistic, democratic vision of a future Syria and are leading the fight against ISIL. Thank you very much. And Paul Collins. <laughs> Yes, a very, very difficult subject. And uh, memory, when this question came up, the thought that crossed my mind was indeed those Libyan souls, those Christian souls who lost their lives 
purely to get publicity around the world. And I think there's another issue we need to address. The world has become much smaller, and the ability to use people like this as pawns against society is terrible. And we need to be looking at our way that the world is working, where our broadcasters repeat this, and this is a BBC issue I saw, and I said, it's something we can talk about and think about. A lot of things at this top table some very good positive ideas, so I'm not going to repeat them again. Pressure on Saudi Arabia by the European Union and other countries is a key issue here in those particular hotspots. But of course, persecution is not just in the Middle East, it's in Russia as well. A society that is very much turning its face against Christianity and other faiths as it tries to push through a secular notion. We need to be aware of this, and that's why anti national is such an important issue here. We need to make sure people are fairly treated throughout the world. I abhor what happened in Libya, and it's up to your people in this top table, whoever you select to vote, to stand up for your parliament and work for your governments to stop it happening. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's quite clear this evening that we're not going to get through all the questions that have been submitted. Um, and our um, candidates here have not seen any of the questions that have been asked of them uh, this evening. But I did say that we would finish with a final question on local issues. So our final question this evening is this. What do you see as the most pressing local issue for this constituency and how would you seek to address it? Julian Weber, please. <coughs> Most pressing local issue. Um, if I had to pick one above all else, I always revert back in terms of general elections to the state of our economy. Uh, our economy affects our jobs, our prosperity, even our ability to spend on vital public services. Um, I think we've witnessed the recovery, but I think we've witnessed the slow recovery in a century. I would hope uh, and would work towards with the Labour government to ensure that that recovery stayed in force. I wouldn't jeopardise that recovery by having a naval gazing uh, exercise in the form of an EU referendum, which I think it is, I'm afraid, I'm thinking the uncertainty it would create in a, in a, in a, a climate sort of, of a fragile recovery is something which is cold that doesn't count as. But perhaps another local issue, if I might maybe allow the indulgence of a second, would be. Uh, our hospital, which I think we must, our local elected representatives must be showing strong support for, and I'm not sure we've always seen that. I think it is a, a loved and cherished uh, local amenity, it's something which I've grown up with because it was visible from the home that I was brought in, and I think the National Health Service is very important. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, a local issue, but I think it's a national one as well. Young people. I want to do more for young people in this town. Housing is an issue. People cannot get into the housing or the housing matter. And it is a terrible situation. It's something we are desperately going to need to think about. So a local issue of housing is something I would want to work for and support. Work in finding jobs as well for the young people. Now, we, I work in the city of London. I work for an insurance broker. And the draw towards the city is very, very important. But we need local jobs here. That's why the airport is important to us. We need to have more issues like that. We need to find more employment in South End to make sure our young people have good jobs and can progress. And therefore, maybe get into the housing ladder, which we need to sort of support. So my focus has always been, and always will be, on the young people in our society to support them to make our town better. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Very clear difference uh, at the moment between the South and Port and South End Airport. But um, so first off, just saying that I think that there's a, uh, we've touched on some incredibly important issues NHS, austerity, taxation, foreign affairs. So um, I'm going to avoid those and come straight on to what I still think is one of the biggest local issues that we, we still need to resolve, which is South End Airport. During the public consultation, that over 80% of people said they didn't want the high growth option, but that's what they wanted, that's what they were given. Um, the, there were a series of opinion polls taken. The, the last one I saw suggested that 61% of people still opposed the expansion of that airport. Now, the supplement that was reached between South End Council, Russia Council, and the airport owners was grossly unfair to the residents of this town. In, out, in London City Airport, for instance, not, uh, flights, uh, 
a band on Sunday mornings. You're not allowed to fly out of Sun uh, London City Airport because of the adverse impact it would have on the residents there. Well, our local authorities didn't care about the residents who live under the airport, under the flight path, or immediately around the airport. Flights start at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday, um, on Sunday mornings. And I, I, I think that was grossly unfair. And the way the residents there were treated was appalling. So, uh, Green Party will correct that by uh, banning night flights and uh, increasing restrictions on flights and early mornings on the weekends. Um, but there is one point I want to correct on Paul, Paul and that is that that uh, airport is just one way traffic. Primarily, the vast majority of people who use that airport are flying abroad. We're doing a brilliant job of creating jobs in Amsterdam and Alicante. We're not creating jobs here in the UK. It's the, on a, on a, the total that we're losing is around about £181 million pounds deficit money that's flying out of the UK. That's a huge drain on the local economy. And it's equivalent to the loss of 7,870 jobs. Not the brightest decision that was ever taken by government. So we need to um, correct that. We need to face up to the fact that uh, Southern Airport has not played out the way it was promised. And that, I'll say, is an issue we still need to resolve. Thank you very much. Well, as I was given the luxury of uh, being the last to speak, I've now changed my mind on, on what I was going to say because I was actually going to talk about um, how we deal with an aging population and people living on their own. But without any doubt at all, uh, I continually raise in Parliament the situation in South End. And I want to see more ambition for the town. And without any doubt, for me, the biggest issue is that of regeneration. The transferring of what we were once a very popular Victorian seaside resort, now developing into a centre for learning. I think we have a marvellous opportunity there. Thanks to the city deal, regeneration is starting. But I absolutely feel, listening to my colleagues in Parliament, that we need to be repositioning ourselves and to be much, much bolder than we are. We have so much to offer in the town, not only in culture and other matters. We need to be much bolder. We are far, far too modest about it. We need to talk up the town rather than run it down. And finally, I think with the talent that we have in town, if only more people would be prepared to get involved in public life, it would make a huge difference in terms of the decisions that are made and how common sense comes to prevail. Thank you. <laughs> and Brian Oakridge, please. I would like to try and squeeze in four, four issues. One, the grammar school. 70% of the places are taken by pupils from London and Essex. I would like to see more effort pushing into giving more opportunities for South End children to enter in, into those schools. The roads out of South End. We've heard of some pretty awful gridlock going on, and once a week I join all the white vans heading off into London at half past five in the morning. There are traffic jams on the A13 at 5.30 in the morning, so I would like to see something done about the two main roads in the London direction. Housing. I want to see more affordable housing in South End to actually build on brownfield sites that we have, housing at the bottom end of the market to relieve that massive pressure that I've seen for myself on the lower price, or not so low price of housing as it's now turning out to be. And finally, the eastern region of Britain has the biggest budgetary problem with health. The, the debt, it sits with the clinical commissioning groups and the hospitals, and we have this crazy situation with the fining of, of South End Hospital for a small percentage over the A&E targets and more money has to be found for the Eastern Region, all of them, but in particular South End Hospital because as has been said, and I totally agree, they provide a truly wonderful service to the people of South End. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, can I say to all of you and to all of you, uh, thank you for making my job quite easy this evening. Thank you for those who submitted questions. We changed some of the wording slightly to sort of incorporate many of the questions that we've had. Um, there are whole areas, as you will appreciate, that we've not been able to touch on. But I'm very grateful, and I think we are all very grateful for you coming this evening. So thank you.